Welcome back to the Eight Man Breakdowns podcast. This is where we discuss all phases of the game of football, including philosophy, play concepts, questions, and more. Joining me today is Coach Chuck Davis. Coach Davis is the head coach at Bishop LeBlanc High School in St. Joe, Missouri, heading into year five as a head coach. He worked at LeBlanc for four years prior as an assistant. They went two and seven in the first year of Eight Man, and his teams have shown consistent success and improvement since he took over. Five and five in his first year as the head coach, district runner-up the following year, and state runner-up in year three. Well, Coach, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So let's just first start with some background info. Just tell us about yourself and how you got into coaching. My name is Chuck Davis. I coach at Bishop LeBlanc High School in St. Joe, Missouri. I was a graduate of that high school and then went on to play for a few years at Avila University in Kansas City. After my college career my younger brother was uh actually the starting quarterback for our high school and his coach contacted me and asked if I could come help coach defensive backs for him so I kind of thought that was a good opportunity to spend time with my brother help him his senior year and when I got back into it I really realized just how important that level of competition was to me and I missed competing and you know, as a way to be a part of the game that I couldn't play anymore so I took on more and more responsibility as an assistant coach. And then uh, when we dropped to eight man, we hired an outside guy who came in and coached for one year and then he left. And I basically was asked to take the job because I was an alumni, knew all the kids. Uh, I had guys that were willing to come help me on the staff and the hire made sense because numbers were such a problem for us in the past. And, I was an assistant basketball coach as well, so I was kind of a familiar face, and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, and how is that? What is that like coaching at your old school? It's kind of neat for me because we're a, a small Catholic private school, and a lot of families grow up and end up sending their kids to LeBlanc that also went to LeBlanc. So I'm starting to coach kids who I'm familiar with their families. Um, you know, I'm a little young still to have kids in high school, so my – my friends don't have kids there yet, but I've got friends who have kids that are in our middle school weights program now. And, um, you know, my son's in sixth grade, so he started lifting weights with the middle school team and he'll play middle school football next year. So it's neat to see teachers who I had when I was young that are still there. Uh, you know, we're kind of more like peers now than we are teacher student relationship, obviously. So them getting to see me grow up a little bit and then also me getting to kind of make a name for myself in a school that helped me have a good experience and get to get to college. It's been really a blessing. And at this point in my life, I couldn't imagine coaching anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. The familiarity would definitely helps with that, I'm sure. And then obviously eight man is more of a small town type thing, but you guys are in the city. What's that like? I mean, is it kind of a small town community even within St. Joe there? Yeah, it is a little bit of a small town feeling in a bigger city. We got three Catholic schools that are um, kindergarten through eighth grade or preschool through eighth grade, and they all kind of feed into the one Catholic high school. And we're all under one umbrella of like, they call it the St. Joe Catholic Academy. So we kind of know from a pretty young age who we're going to have coming up through LeBlanc in years to come. So it feels a little smaller than it is. And obviously you have kids that go to public schools who end up transferring in and, and uh, kids that decide to go for a Catholic education just in high school, not in grade school. But for the most part, the kids all know each other, even from all the other schools long before they get to LeBlanc. So the small town feel of familiarity, like you said, and, and not having to do any real introductions and there's really no strangers is nice. But on the flip side, it is somewhat difficult when you know, there's three public high schools in St. Joe that all kind of have their own athletics that they're known for being good at. So, you know, there's a, a school that's always typically good at basketball. There's a school that's always really good at baseball. And then there's the big high school in the middle of the city that's in the suburban conference. So they play like Staley, Liberty North, like the big schools. So getting kids who are really good at sports is sometimes a challenge to get them to stay because they think they have a better opportunity to get looked at elsewhere if they're kids that are planning on going to playing in college. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. 
So just what would you say separates Bishop LeBlanc from some of the other eight-man teams in Missouri? I think the first thing I would say, and this could be probably misinterpreted as uh, overconfident, but I would say I have the best assistant coaches. Our offensive coordinator is – he was on the staff last year, but he's going to be offense coordinator this upcoming year for the first time. And he was a head coach for 21 years. Our head baseball coach is an assistant. And then I've got an assistant coach who played football and baseball at Missouri Western. And then we got a young guy on the staff that played for me when I was an assistant. We were 11 man, was an offensive lineman. And he is, he's like 20 years old, high energy. So I think having a lot of assistants Oh, and then we have one guy that just came on last year uh, all the way from Arizona, just moved to St. Joe. He was a football coach out, out there too. So we got a lot of guys with a lot of experience, whereas I know even when I first started, it was like if you don't have guys volunteering like dads, then you kind of were on your own. And I went to a, a clinic, another coach in Missouri, actually is the only coach on staff as the head coach just by himself. So wow. I think – my access to guys that are willing to help that actually know a lot about football really helps me out a lot. And then we uh, have a really supportive base of parents. Uh, obviously, as a private school, we have a little bit higher income probably on average. We have parents that are willing to volunteer to bring in food every Friday before games. They feed the JV team on Mondays for our JV games. There's always Gatorade and chocolate milk for after the games. So the support we get from all of the people in the school and the parents especially is is huge. And I'm sure everybody probably has answers similar to that, but it does feel like everything that they do to help us out is just one more thing off my plate. So it's it's been awesome. Now that you say all that, I remember you talking about this at the clinic, how you had like a picture of you and five assistants or something. And I was like, holy cow, at the eight-man level, that is, that is huge. That's awesome that you guys have, you know, head coaching experience on staff not to say that you have to have an assistant that has head coaching experience but that definitely helps i mean they've been in that situation they know but that is yeah and i for me when i started i was what 30 years old as a head coach and mm -hmm. i did hadn't really had a lot of plans on becoming a head coach so i found that having guys around me that have been there for a while and done it at a high level kind of challenges me to excel in my role and yeah. do the best I can because if you don't show up ready to go and you got guys that know you're not ready, yeah. it's kind of a bad look. And so high, holding myself to a higher standard has really pushed me to become the best coach I can be just by having guys around me that are good. Absolutely. Yeah. Those guys might be questioning, you know, what's this guy doing? Yeah. If, and I, I agree. That's definitely a great approach to to hold yourself to a higher standard. So my question though, would be based on that, could you talk more about what your assistant coaching roles are? Like, how do you delegate those position groups or weekly coaching assignments? What do you do to make sure those guys are doing their job to the best they can? My first year as an assistant with the introduction to the eight man experience, that head coach kind of had a laid back approach. Like, well, it's, you know, it's just eight man. It was a little more like, let's go have fun, have six or seven plays and kind of do what we do and see how it goes. The assistant that I worked under when we were 11 man is in the Missouri Coaches Hall of Fame. He was a head coach for 45 years, um, and he was the polar opposite. Everything was planned out to the minute. So I kind of took a lot of what I do week to week from him, and if I had had any issues on his level of organization, they were definitely squashed by seeing what disorganized does. So I have an offensive coordinator and his job essentially on Saturday is to break down the film from our opponent for that week. So he watches just their defensive film. So all of their defensive plays from every film that we can get on them. And he creates a scouting report for the defensive side of the ball. And I call our defense. So I watch the other team's offense and create a scouting report on that. And then we each put in on huddle, we name their plays, what we would call it in our verbiage, so our kids understand. And we put it all in on huddle to get tendency reports. And we really do, we spend pretty much all day Saturday together on film. But he and I get along really well, so it's a lot of fun. 
And then Sundays, the coaches all get together Sunday night, usually after the Chiefs play, and we talk about the plan for the week. So he runs, obviously, our offense during practice. But when we're in defensive team, he runs our offensive scout team. So I draw up play cards, give them to him. We're using our technique, our verbiage with their plays. So it's kind of like the younger kids get coached by the offensive coordinator, but they're helping us out at the same time. And then vice versa for the defensive scout team when it's varsity O. He coaches the O-line and the quarterbacks for position groups. I work with the receivers. The head baseball coach I told you about, he helps with the linemen. And then the running backs are coached by a coach from Arizona. And then on the defense side of the ball, I take the linebackers. Arizona coach takes the defensive backs. And then he and that baseball coach take the D linemen. So all the linemen basically stay with the same guys. The skill guys kind of stay with the same coaches. But we do a lot of individual periods, everyday drills. And it's always with your position coach. And they kind of follow you throughout the day. Because Tuesday is mostly offense. Wednesday is mostly defense. Thursdays we do walkthroughs of everything. And so we really get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with each player, even if they're just freshmen or scout team type guys. So being able to delegate a lot of that out to the other coaches allows me to spend one-on-one -on -one time with essentially every kid throughout every day and kind of see where their head's at, ask them how the school's going, you know, if they need help in any classes, if they're staying out of trouble, all that good stuff. But each of those coaches kind of has what we need to work on in the back of their mind to start each week. So maybe our defensive backs did a bad job getting beat over the top. That's a point of emphasis for the week. And they get all that in the practice schedule each day. So everyday drills and then off to the side, I'll put emphasis on whatever it is maybe we struggled with. I know when I first started as an assistant, I remember being on the opposite of what you're doing. Not that it wasn't structured practices, but as an assistant, when I first started, I didn't know what my role was, whereas you have fully given each coach a, a job to do and then trusted them to do it, which is it's awesome. That That's obviously paying off for you guys. So kind of jumping back a little bit, but it's something you mentioned on the Google form, but you said your roster has kind of grown, you know, since you guys started an eight man and now you're up to having 33 players last year. I just, I don't know the Missouri eight man landscape, you know, how the classifications work. Is there one full eight-man classification, or is there two divisions? Or how do you know if you're going to be eight-man? Is there a cutoff for enrollment? Just talk about Missouri eight-man, if you would. So Missouri classifies you uh, based on freshmen through juniors, and you have to be under 150 in those three classes, total students, to be able to play eight-man football. So, you know, you could be 70% female, 30% male, but if you're under – 150 in freshman through junior classes, then you can play eight man. So I think last year we were 137 total freshman through junior. So we were under that limit, but we kind of are a little bit different because we're one of very few eight man schools in Missouri that offer boys soccer and boys cross country. So I had 33 boys on my team. Soccer team had 20 soccer players and we had a cross country team. So pretty, basically every male student in the school played a uh, fall sport. And then Missouri has one class of eight man and it's grown steadily over the years. I think we had two drop down for this upcoming season. So we'll be at um, between like 42 and 45 somewhere total teams in eight man. You're getting close to 50. Is it, I mean, is it pretty widespread across the state or, I mean, is there a lot more travel elsewhere? Or? We Unfortunately, are not in a conference for eight-man football. Our school is in a, a conference with bigger schools for every other sport, mm -hmm. just because of our location, really. And so our away games, like last year, our first two games were away, and they were the first game was three hours away, and the second game was like three hours and fifteen minutes away. Next year, we'll have to travel four hours to a game. So some of our away games are are away, away. But Northwest Missouri, where we're at, really is a, a pretty talented hub for eight-man football. North Andrew, the team that beat us in the state championship is 30 minutes north of us. So if you're in a conference, you don't really have to travel quite as far for the most part. We unfortunately are not. So we got to take games where we can get them. So sometimes we do end up traveling pretty far. So pretty much though, in your, in your conference, the, all the other teams are just still 11 man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. In Kansas, just for your information, 
we have 48 Division One teams, and next year there will be 39 Division Two, and then like 25 six man. So the difference in Division Two and Division One is Division One has the higher enrollment. So basically, that Division Two enrollment cutoff changes based on the lowest enrollment school in Division One. So there could be a team with 70 students, 8 through 11 is how they do it. Okay. Very similar, but there could be a 70 to 80 high school enrollment school that's in Division One competing against the bigger schools, which, anyway, that's the way it is. But And then we have two eight-man state champs, Division One, Division Two. So Okay, yeah, that makes sense. All right, let's go to this next question. Sorry, I'm dragging on telling you Kansas. Oh, no problem. Right. Interesting. I don't. I would never know any of this information, so it's kind of cool hearing the Kansas side of it. Yeah, speaking of that, do you guys ever play a Kansas team being right there on the border? We played Donovan West my first – our first three years in eight-man. Okay. And then they had a scheduling conflict. Somebody else needed a game that was a Kansas school. And kind of like Missouri, in Kansas, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good – for your postseason to play a team from the other state. So understandably, they they kicked us from their schedule and picked up another Kansas team. But I think they're going 11, man, last I heard. Yeah, they are. But here I want to talk about defense, if you don't mind. No, not at all. So, and I know I've seen you speak on this, so I know what you do. But to the listeners out there, what do you guys do defensively? So we are a 3-3 stack. I took the 3-3 stack from 11, man, and kind of – molded it to fit an eight man so we're three down linemen three backers and then our two corners are kind of like corner safety hybrid types uh we run primarily zone defense so out of that we can run we call it halves coverage outside backers have the flats the corners are like deep safeties they have half their half of the field nothing over the top of them and then we can we run man to man out of that and I like to send linebackers. We blitz a lot and we move the D line around a lot. So we kind of do all the fun, funky stuff that you're supposed to be able to do in 11 man when you have safeties like alley players, but we kind of just try to fill gaps off of the holes that we lose blitzing guys. So we probably look kind of wild defensively at times, but I feel like there's a method to the madness and we're getting a, a heck of a lot better as our younger kids are coming up through the ranks. So I would call it a three, three stack, but just calling it like a, the eight-man version. And, and that was my next question I had on there, too, was what led you into the 3-3? Three, three? I'm assuming you did that when you were in high school then? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, we did that when I was in high school. And then I also toyed around with a four-man front. But honestly, we just had – we had so few linemen that mm -hmm. could play both ways for an entire game that I tried to get as, as few big bodies on the field at a time as I could and kind of utilize our – skill players because we have more of those at linebacker and, and corner so it was out of necessity at first they only had 19 kids on the team i just was trying not to run guys too ragged but it's been a good fit for us just based on personnel and speaking of your 3-3 again and i know it's not a true 3-3 like you said you can adapt it in a, a many different ways but how does that fit with the offensive landscape of Missouri eight-man teams what do you see on a weekly basis what's the main offensive schemes luckily what, with us when we were early in eight-man we had a kind of a crazy schedule because it was just so pieced together late that we saw a lot of everything so we you know it was probably 50 percent teams that ran spread and doubles empty and threw the ball every down and then we the next week would be double tight eye the team that beat us in the state title game was on our regular season schedule up until this past year. And they were a two tight eye team. They threw the ball five times in the state title game. They were two for five, 15 yards passing. So um, we see a lot of running the ball, but when we do face teams that run spread, it's like passing every down. So we played a team, the same team twice last year and they averaged 73 points a game. If you exclude our two games, because their quarterbacks had, six foot six division one basketball player and he just chucked the ball 60 yards in the air every single down so i would say it's it's we see a wide variety of of stuff up here and it just kind of i think the missouri coaches in general do a pretty good job of utilizing their the kids that they have available to them for example we play a team from down south that 
doesn't have really any big bodied kids that you consider a traditional lineman. And they were in swinging gate for probably 25% of the game we played them. So we get a lot thrown at us, but with our three, three stack, rather than bringing in an extra lineman, like when we see a double tight situation, that's when I'll walk linebackers up and blitz either off the edge or through an A gap, or we'll slant our line to where we think they're going to run the ball. Like we might slant to the wide side of the field and bring a linebacker off the edge. So there's ways we can make our three, three a little bit more fitting against a double tight team. But, you know, right about the time you go four man front is when you'll see a team that is all empty doubles or trips and throws the ball every down. So long story short, we kind of see it all. Yeah. And that's good that coaches are adapting to their players. The adaptability of your defense. That's the thing I love about the, the three, three. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I like what you did too. I mean, talking about the blitzes and being aggressive. Can you talk more about that? Do you, is it all called by you, the whole entire, all blitzes, or is, do you allow your Mike linebacker to, call a blitz every once in a while or how, how do you do that uh, that's a, a really good question actually because it's a little bit of both so i'll call blitzes from the sideline we're all hand signals mm -hmm. and then we have like code words that i can just call on the fly and our defense does a really good job of communicating so if the the corner on my on the, our sideline hears me they can relay it to the linebackers if they can't hear but we do have some automatic calls that i allow any of the three linebackers to make for example if we are in a team we call it spread so like two receivers to one side one receiver to the other side quarterback and running back in the backfield if they motion the number two receiver and we are in man against that that linebacker has the ability to bump the coverage to the other backer and then he can automatically blitz off the edge if he's to that single receiver side so that's something he can call on his own we watch a whole lot of film and mm -hmm. so there might be times where we say, hey, when they motion away, we're not going to be able to automatically blitz, but there's always a, a, you know, a reason behind it. And then our Mike linebacker, anytime he thinks he can get through an A-gap, we let him send the nose guard to an A-gap, and then he goes opposite. If I call a blitz that's not to the mic, then he can't do that. But if, it, if we're just in a base defense and he likes what he sees, then, then he's off to the races. And we had a game actually – this past year where our Mike linebacker intercepted a bobbled snap, the quarterback hadn't even caught the ball yet all the way, and he took it to the end zone the other direction. So wow. um, I'm lucky to have really good athletes at the three linebacker spots. And next year, the our Mike linebacker will have been – he'll be a four-year starter, and the two outside backers will be three-year starters. So they'll probably continue to get a little more responsibility put on them, a little more freedom to, to play loose. I think that especially an eight-man – if your linebackers are having fun and playing loose, they play downhill a little faster, and the faster they can get downhill, obviously the better. Absolutely. That makes me think of your next question, you know, playing fast and not really thinking but just reacting. Do you guys – what's the read? Are they reading guards, reading backfield, quarterback? Our backers, we read the near back. So if, like, you're in I formation, the mic would have the fullback, then both outside backers have the tailback. And then if they're in split backs, obviously the outside backers would have the back to their side. The mic backer would then read the quarterback. We've done it a couple different ways. We tried to do read the backs through the guard, but we really just practice a lot on reading your key and, and noticing pullers. So we'll just have their key take a couple steps with a lineman either down blocking or pulling. So they can recognize blocks while reading, reading their keys fairly well. The, and like you said, you're, you're scouting. If they're prepared and prepped on what the offense does, then yeah, they can get a read that much better too. When you said that, I remember from your presentation there that you said read the near back. That yeah. I, I now remember that. But yeah, no, I, I love the, the adaptability of your 3-3. Three, three and, and I mean, that'll be huge for you next year with all that experience returning. Not without some growing pains. You know, starting a freshman at middle linebacker was uh, less than ideal for, for us and for him, I'm sure. But He's a tough kid now. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that freshman year might not have been that fun for him. But, yeah, absolutely got that great experience and grew up fast. And, and now it's going to be rewarding for sure. I have one more question before we go to this next one. But talking about your scouting, I'm a huge fan of the end zone cam. I don't remember if you had talked about – do you guys use an end zone cam, drone at practices or anything? We do not. 
Uh, I actually went to a clinic that the coach used a drone and we saw a lot of drone footage just a couple of weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I am a firm believer that filming your practices are beneficial. So I'll, I'll probably end up getting a drone before mm -hmm. summer ball starts. But as of right now, we do not use okay. a, a drone or an end zone game. Okay. No worries. Just thought came across my mind, but, uh, um, and another thing I do want to ask too, I mean, have you always been more on the defensive side of the ball? You ever done any offense? I've always been pretty defensive minded. I, I played corner and safety in high school and then went to college, like recruited as a safety and a long snapper. So I do our special teams too. I, I love special teams, but offensively, I feel like I have an idea of what I want our offense to look like. And this new offensive coordinator and I have sat down and really talked a lot about what the future of LeBlanc football needs to look like in the eight man level. So calling plays has never been something that I enjoy as much as calling defenses. Mm -hmm. But again, that's part of that is me just re recognizing that there are guys on the staff that do a better job than know more than I do about that. And mm -hmm. relinquishing that responsibility to a guy who I know is going to do a great job is uh, a humbling experience, but we'll be better off for it. And let me ask you another question here, just talking defense, but I've had many coaches on here and I've asked several different coaches and sometimes it's, I don't know, there's different answers all the time, but just your approach to tackling and how do you teach it? I've been coaching for going on 10 years now, um, seven as assistant, two as a head coach. And I still, I don't know, I'm always looking for ways I can improve my approach to tackling or my, just how do I teach it and the drills we do? What What do you guys do? So that was, that's still, I think, the hardest part of side of the ball, especially through the week and like through the summer. What's too much? How much contact is unnecessary? Like you want to leave head injuries out of the game as much as you can, but like can't just not tackle in practice. So what I do is essentially the first week of the summer when we're not in pads, everything is like hip tracking. And so we'll do a lot of open field drills where we just tag off on the near hip. And it's full speed, full go, but then just like you're there, tag them up. When I learned to play defense, I was always taught to get my helmet across the ball, like to the upfield side. Mm -hmm. And now that I have seen a little more and know a little more, obviously 20 years ago when I was playing, the information wasn't out there really about the effects of concussions. I personally now think anywhere in the open field, we track – the ball carriers close hip and then it is run through their thigh board or hip pad with your head on the back side so we're like rugby style tackling but if you're a linebacker and the ball is between the guards like in the a gaps we still try to do shoulder pad thigh board ish area and head across the ball but in the open field i've seen too many kids get ran over trying to get their head across and it for me, it's safer for the for the ball carrier and safer for the tackler to just rugby style tackle. And you know, you're not gonna make ESPN doing that, but kids are less afraid, it seems like. And when you aren't as scared, you are a way better tackler. Probably the best compliment I've ever had was the team that won state this past season is on our regular season schedule. And that coach gave a presentation at our Missouri clinic and he said that. You know, normally teams put their worst tacklers at their corner or safety positions. And they said, except for Bishop LeBlanc, their corners always tackle really well. Because we don't get our heads into the play very much, we can do a lot of it in practice. So our open field tackling drills, a lot of them you could probably do without helmets on at all. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd say rugby style as much as possible. And then get your hat across the ball if you're, you know, fullback has maybe a three yard head of steam. Our linebackers play at five yards. In the trash, you can use your shoulder pads and, and kind of lay the boom. But out in space, just take the guy down. I love that. That's an awesome approach. I'm taking notes here, by the way, the whole time. But like you said, the first week of summer, you're hip tracking, just the open field tagging. At least in the last two years, me being the head coach here, I have not done any full speed style tackling stuff at all leading up to full pads. But in Kansas, you got that that first week of practice, you have to have the – build up yeah slow they call it the 
acclimatization yeah, or yeah. acclimation period. Yep. Acclimated to the heat, to the weather, obviously. But, you know, that first couple of days with helmets only, the only tackling I can think of doing, even all the way back when I first started coaching, just the three feet apart, working on form tackle. I mean, that was literally all yeah. I did. So that would be an excellent addition to what we'll do here in the in the off season too, open field tagging. That that's a great idea. So thank you for sharing your of course tackle thoughts there. Yeah, I would be a terrible defense coordinator. In I mean, I was I was our defense coordinator my first year here, but due to default essentially because our three assistants didn't have the the time, so I had to do both. And wow, um, I've learned that I'm not like you. I'm better off on the other <laughs> side. Or I'm defense either... at eight man is is fascinating to me because it is difficult because offenses can be so all over the place in eight man it seems like even more so than 11 man that the defensive side of the ball there's always a but what if they do x y or z and i was just uh, talking to a coach this is their second year of eight man they were 11 man for i mean the history of their school until the last two years and this year they went they lost first game one ten in a row went to the semifinals and and lost to the defending state champs and but he said, because I asked him, what is, what's his thoughts on defense compared to 11-man, 8-man, or what? He said, any 8-man coaches, you know, be patient with your defense. Like, they ran four, essentially four different de- defenses throughout the year because talking about that adjustment, there's no overhang defender. You do that, then yep. you're exposing yourself. And in offenses nowadays, read more than anything. So, you know, you still got one guy potentially on block. And he was just talking about, you know, be patient with it and be ready to adapt, you know, like kind of like you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And my first, when I when we first started running our three, three, I would have our outside backers run with the motion. And because that's what we did in 11, man, but we had a safety over the top all the time. And so the first time we played an option team, they would just motion from a two receiver side that motion and our linebacker vacated and they ran option and it was two on one against our corner. And so it was like, holy cow, I can't do that. We just got torched because we're misaligned. And so the film study on when stuff like that happens is, again, I'm going to use the word again, it's humbling for me because, you know, that's not Johnny's fault they scored a touchdown. That's Coach Davis's fault. Yeah, but there you go. That's just the learning part of eight-man too. I mean, even if you've been coaching it, because this coach, Coach Roach from El Saline, he's been coaching football for 30 years, but only second year eight-man. He said, I mean, you got to keep learning. I mean, it's it's a whole different game. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So here, let me uh, go to the next question here. And it's not even really a question. Just tell us about last year, you know, a little talk about your team. Tell us a little bit how last season went. Well, last season we had four seniors and two of them were starters. Uh, one of them kind of, he got a concussion earlier in, in the season and never really made his way back full time. Our quarterback was a first year starter as a sophomore. The quarterback that we had the previous year, the year we went to state, he was a four-year starting quarterback. Uh, His senior year, he had 53 touchdown passes and five interceptions. And he had 23 rushing touchdowns. So he was phenomenal for us. And so we knew there was going to be some growing pains. We would have to look a little different. I think defensively, we were better this past year. We held teams to fewer points. Uh, Most teams scored under their average, at least against us. But we had a, quite a few guys return from that previous year. Um, and our quarterback from week one to week nine was a totally different player. He is falling in love with the weight room, loves the process. The thought of him potentially being a three-year starter is is uh, pretty appealing to him. And his dad is the offense coordinator now. So he's he lives with his quarterback coach and O.C., so I feel for the kid in that way because nobody's tougher on him than his dad is, but I think he's going to be something special here moving forward. Um, I think we underutilized a couple of key positions, if, if I'm being totally honest. Uh, we had an all, all-state tight end as a sophomore the previous year, and he didn't get enough touches. Obviously, he's a guy that everyone had on their radar because he is so good, but I think next season he'll be more involved. And then um, – bringing back six starters on each side of the ball for next year. I think it's going to be good for them that we struggled a little bit last year going four and five. And our last loss was to a team that St. Joe Christian that's in town, kind of a in town rival. They all know each other and it hurt a lot 
for those, especially for the, the juniors who were a part, a big part of the state title team. Well, second place in state, I should say. But they were a big part of, of our success there. And they went from playing on Mizzou's field to losing on uh, St. Joe team's field. And I think that that loss will end up being the most pivotal point of their high school careers. So I, I'm excited to see what next year brings. We got a lot of kids that are ready to go, and we're bringing in 14 freshmen. So I think our roster is going to grow a little bit next year as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And anytime you can have it's essentially 75%, six returners coming back on a on a team, that's definitely great for the future. And as you said earlier, too, the you're lo- losing that four-year starter even – and defensively, was he the, the Mike linebacker you were talking about? No, he was our outside linebacker. Okay. But it's similar to that same guy that – or the other guy, excuse me, that was a four-year starter on defense. I mean, that freshman year might not be – very good but they they learn and obviously that was huge for him a phenomenal senior season and I was in a similar situation this year we had a sophomore quarterback start for the first time and I agree same deal week one to week nine way different kid you know I mean yeah. improved so much throughout the year you mentioned the room to grow as coaches you know in the game plan find ways to get more guys the ball Probably most importantly, as you said, the motivating loss to end the season. You know, that thinks that losing that game or losing your last game, but that might have been what they needed, you know, these underclassmen coming back. But real quick, too, you said 14 freshmen incoming. How's the junior high team been? How'd they do? Uh, they actually – they lost one game last year, and it was by – I believe it was by two points, and it was to that same St. Joe Christian team. They have a, a really good middle school program with pretty good numbers as well. So. Both eight-man teams in town are growing. Uh, They just actually, their coach stepped away after this past season, so they got a new guy in there who, from everything I've heard, is is really well-liked by all the players, and he's a super dedicated guy to the school and kind of a St. Joe Christian name. So I think he's going to do a great job, too. None of those facts are are, uh, going unnoticed by our kids. So I think it's fun to have quasi-rivalry here six miles apart from each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, like you said, you, that's just another way we're going to have to adapt and grow and we'll see film on a, a brand new coach with the new schemes. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. As a high school coach, your team essentially is essentially you got a brand new team every year. You know, you got to, that's the, that excitement for that new season to how good can this team be? But anyway, um, and you kind of already talked a little bit about that. This next question I had of like what you're looking forward to most so I'll go to the the last question. So final question, any advice to current or upcoming football coaches out there? What advice would you give? I would say know what you do really well. And on the flip side, know what you struggle with. So like we talked about earlier, I don't feel like I am knowledgeable enough on the offensive side of the ball at every position to be the play caller and the offensive coordinator. And so I found – a really good offensive coordinator who's called plays for a really long time, who is willing to come in and and be on the staff for next to no money and spend seven days a week in the fall with me. He's a guy that's also helping middle school weights. And so I see him twice a week, basically all year. Uh, And we talk on the phone every day. And I've learned more from him, certainly more from him than I, than he's ever going to learn from me. Uh, I'm just about the game in general. And so being self-aware and humble enough to not, you know, I'm the head coach my way or the highway. That may have worked in the past. Like when we were playing, our head coaches might have had that Wild West mentality. But I think in today's game, if you want to be successful, you have to surround yourself with the best people. And then learn the game. You know, we have a Missouri Eight-Man Football Coaches Association has a clinic every year. It just happened. And people are busy. And I understand, like, you know, some guys – referee basketball or coach basketball like I do Uh, they might do track and it's kind of right in the beginning of that springtime kickoff but get to every clinic you can and study what other people are doing make connections like I find myself on this podcast because you were at a clinic that I was presenting at if you listen to me talk for three hours and you took away one comment you're like okay that makes sense then it was worth your time going out there a lot of what I do is stolen directly from other people even about like how I set the program up, what we do for pregame 
organization, how I organize my practice schedule. None of that's like me reinventing the wheel. It's just this worked for coach so-and-so. Let's try it out at LeBlanc. So I think always being a student of the game and being humble enough to know what you need to work on and what you are good at and delegating accordingly is are, are two crucial keys that luckily I had mentors teach me pretty early on. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I like all that that you said. And yeah, definitely surrounding yourself with the best people, but don't be afraid to learn and keep learning. I mean, I've, like I was just talking about Coach Roach, he's been coaching for 30 years and I'm 30 years old. So he's been coaching yeah. as long as I've been alive and he's still growing and learning, you know, but I think anybody that is listening to this or, you know, going to those clinics that you're presenting at, then, then there you go. They're, they're doing what they need to be to keep growing. But no, I, I like, like you said, to make connections. Yeah, absolutely. Go to clinics. And nowadays there's really not an excuse to not find it. Everything is out there. You know, Twitter is so big. But yeah, yeah that's, that's really a new, that's probably a, another good advice for an upcoming coach is embrace social media. I know it's not always good. So there's definitely a lot of negatives to go with it, but you know, nothing is more exciting to these players than when I post like a highlight of somebody mm -hmm. tag them on Twitter. It's like, I would have freaked out if my coach did that when I was in high school. Not that that was possible, but mm -hmm. now it's like, if you take the time out of your day to share something, I mean, there's college coaches out there on Twitter that that's what they do. Scour Twitter looking for kids highlight tapes that, you know, they, you might get a scholarship just off of sharing something that you thought was one nice play. So embrace the social media and keep it football. Nobody needs to hear about like all the, your other opinions, really politics and hot button items. But if you can have a Twitter and make it all ball, it'll be real helpful. That's a big thing. Well said, uh, yeah, putting stuff out on your kids, like, I agree. I mean, Twitter wasn't just same as you. It wasn't around for my coach to do that, and my coach was anti-technology. I mean, he didn't – anyways, won't go there. But, no, that it's so important when, I mean, a kid sees that and thinks much more highly of you even then. And it kind of goes to what you said here on your form about let the kids know that you care about them, you know, more than just wins and losses. I mean, if my coach is willing to take the time to just post a video or a tweet about me or whatever – there you go. I mean, that's supporting your kids. I think another way to support them, and I put this on that on the Google form, is go to more than just football. You know, I, I know a lot of football coaches that they say like in the fall, they call their wives like fall widows, but then the other three seasons of the school year, they are at home or they don't go to anything. If you can find a way to like be present at basketball games and track meets or cross country, even stuff in the fall that's not football, the more you go to and just sit in the bleachers and eat popcorn and watch these kids play their other sports or go to the plays and watch them do the musical at the high school, the best ability is availability, in my opinion. So the more you're around, the more you're present, the more kids have friends say, hey, you should play football. And then they already know that the coach is somebody that's going to be around and available and somebody that you're a familiar face. And so uh, I found that the more I involve myself and my family in LeBlon, the more kids are willing to work hard for me because they know that that hard work and effort is reciprocated. And I know the flip side of that was maybe it started with COVID, you know, but when everything went to live stream, people have that excuse of, oh, I'll just watch it. I mean, yeah, that's not, it's not the same yep. thing. Get out there and support them, no. be in the stands. Yeah. And, and this is coming from the AD side of me too, you, because, when a team is struggling, you need everybody there. But yep, absolutely. But on top of that, also in Kansas, it's a big issue right now. It was potentially going to be legislation passed or trying to be proposed for it about positive sportsmanship towards officials. So, I mean, that is a big thing. Be there, but be positive, you know. Yeah, that's a crazy problem in, in Missouri, too. Not as much in eight-man football, mm -hmm. but, you know, our basketball team goes and plays, like, 4A schools, like, way much much bigger schools and we do we see a little bit not it's never gotten like physical or dangerous or anything but some of the stuff that some of the fans feel that they need to share with the officials or with the players is just i, I think you're right i think it did get way worse during covid because that's stuff you can yell at your television from the comfort of your couch yeah should not share it in public yeah i don't know what the the right answer is i guess necessarily i mean i've had to remove fans from games but i don't know that 
that solves everything. You know, usually it doesn't solve anything. They're at the, they're at the next game. You know, at a different right. site where that host now has to worry about it. But anyway, anyway, but yeah, I agree. Definitely a unfortunate issue that maybe legislation is needed. I don't know. Yeah. Well, here I'll uh, I'll wrap this up. But yeah, seriously, though, coach, thanks for uh, taking the time to do this. I do really appreciate you making the time. And I don't remember if you said you coach track or anything. You were saying basketball earlier, but. Either way, thanks for uh, taking the time out to do this with me. Oh, I, I appreciate it. This was an awesome experience. I've done a couple of these podcasts with, with other guys, mostly in Missouri, but you do a great job. Thanks again, Coach. And that's going to do it for this episode of the 8-Man Breakdowns podcast. If you ever have a question for me, feel free to comment below on this video or follow and message me on Twitter at 8-Man Breakdowns. If you've learned anything or enjoyed the video, please click subscribe and check out some of my other videos right here. And as always, guys, thanks for tuning in.